Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Digital Nomad World Weekly Lecture. I'm Becky, and I'm here today with Anna Mazurik, who is going to talk with us about how to boost your productivity as a digital nomad. Welcome to the show, Anna. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. I'm really interested in this topic because... So the listeners know, I do not feel like a productive person. And for those of you out there who also feel the same, I hope that Anna can give us some great tips today. But first, Anna, I would love to hear about your background and how you became a digital nomad. Well, I am a freelance photographer and writer. I focus mostly on travel journalism. I shoot for a variety of publications, ranging from the Washington Post to Afar and Texas Monthly, and I do corporate work for clients like Facebook. But then uh, on top of that, I also teach for two universities in Texas remotely, teach a business class on freelancing for media majors and workshops on freelancing. And I also am a photo instructor for a travel company as well. So I, my background is that I have a master's degree in photojournalism from the University of Missouri. And when I graduated from school, this is sort of how I became a nomad was that I got an internship at a publishing company. And then right afterwards, I got hired as a contract photographer and got paid to travel across the Southeast and was living the dream. This is great, you know, career-wise, but then the economy tanked because it was 2008. And I learned really quickly that recessions are not good for freelance photographers. And so I basically quit everything and moved to Australia on a work visa. And I spent a year traveling. I didn't know anyone, but I had some money saved. And it might seem like a bold move in uncertain times, but I had an abundance of time. So I made the most of that. And then I got a job running photo trips um, in Southeast Asia for five summers. And I kind of got stuck in this pattern of saving money that allowed me to travel, but I was like quitting my job to travel and it became, you know, or I was working some sort of seasonal job that gave me the ability to travel, but it wasn't a very sustainable model. So I really focused on upping my game and freelancing and focused on steady recurring clients. And that sort of enabled me to travel full time. And then, you know, I also saved up a good chunk of money to have as a cushion because nothing kills creativity more than worrying about money. And so that just made it easier to go freelance full time. And I've been location independent. I've been freelancing my entire career, but I've been location independent. Um, since 2017. And then it took me a good decade to sort of figure out how to travel and work sustainably, but it was completely worth the effort for me. Wow. So it sounds like you have a lot of experience with juggling a lot of different things. And it says, it seems like now you're doing a lot of things. So I imagine you have to be quite productive and quite organized to be able to keep everything, uh, uh, you know, to know what you're going to do next in your day. So I'm really excited to hear, because we're going to talk today about productivity. Um, I want to hear about your productivity journey through all of this. Um, so have you always been a productive person? Yes, I cannot sit still. <laughs> so it drives me crazy to not be productive. I think it's sort of a part of my built into my character. But despite that, I can be easily distracted and can procrastinate, especially when I'm stressed. But the trick to me is just finding a balance um, for that. So do you have any tips for how to become a more productive person? Yes, I have several. So first, I recommend a few books that were very helpful for me. One of them is called When the Scientific Secret of Perfect Timing by Daniel Pink. Um, then there's Deep Work by Cal Newport. And the other one is Atomic Habits by James Clear. These are all like New York Times bestsellers. so They're very easy to find. And I do find that productivity is a very personal thing. What works for me might not work for you, but there are some overall strategies that you can apply at an individual level. And the Daniel Pink book really kind of digs into like the science behind timing, according to research and psychology and biology and economics. And I found that to be really helpful for me because it helped me realize like what time of day I work best and batching the type of work into the hours that best suit it. And for me, that is starting the most creative project first or the biggest thing first. You know, I used to have this long to-do list and I'm like, oh, let me do all these little things first. So my, you know, my to-do list gets you know, shorter and shorter, but then I just wasn't using my creative energy effectively. And so I save all my emails and like tedious tasks for after lunch or the end of the day. And I've been, I've been doing a lot more writing lately with my freelance work. And that's the type of creative energy that I just can't do all day long or if I'm really exhausted at the end of the day. So it's best for me to write and edit, especially editing stories first thing in the morning when I'm fresh. So if I'm turning in a story to a newspaper publication, I'm going to get first thing in the morning, look at that, give it a good edit, go through, read it with a fresh eye before I submit it. And then, you know, photos, I can edit photos late at night. It doesn't bother me, but writing is something that really drains me. So I have to schedule that accordingly. So for me, it was figuring out what type of work I do best when. And then I also really like to work in advance and be way ahead because the freelance world is like a monsoon season. You have these 
you know, you have these periods where you're just super busy and, you know, and then all of a sudden it'll kind of it'll have a bit of a lull. It's just, I think life is like that in general, but I get stressed out if I'm not far enough ahead. And by working ahead, that it allows me to sort of plan with like, Hey, this monsoon season's coming up this busy period. So if I can do things that will make my life easier in a few months, then that's something that I really will focus on. And so that really is a big thing that has helped me. Okay, some great things in there. So um, first of all, you say you check your emails later in the day. Um, I will admit that I often will check them as one of the first things I do. I don't know if a lot of people do that, but um, what is the case for checking them later? Because for me, I'm thinking, oh, what if I, I miss something or I, something is sent early in the morning and then it's something that should be done earlier. Um, I would think I need to check, but that's maybe just something I'm telling myself. For me, it depends on the time zone that I'm in, what I'm working with and where the people I'm working with, like editors would be. It like, I'm currently in Thailand. So like that 12 hour difference, I will check my email when I wake up to see what's there. But usually I'm not responding or acting on those emails till later in the day. And I mean, if it's something urgent, then, you know, I might have to do that right now. But when it comes to responding and doing all that tedious stuff, because it does take time to sit there and respond, especially, uh, you know, and kind of work things out. And so that's something that I do save for later in the day if I can, unless it's something urgent. But I will potentially look at them depending on the time zone I'm in first thing in the morning, because if I can catch someone like on Pacific Coast time before they get out of the office when I'm first waking up here, you know, in Chiang Mai, then that's something that I would do. In terms of emails, are you an inbox zero person, Anna? And can you explain what I mean by inbox zero? So inbox zero means that you have no unread emails. You've got inbox zero every day. And I'm very close to that. Not all the time. I do leave certain emails unread as sort of a thing like, hey, I need to address this or hey, don't forget about that. It's meant to be sort of a reminder in certain ways or certain things that are very important. I leave them like that until I do them. And then once they're done, they're out of there. So, but it's it's definitely below 10 at least. It just depends on things. But yeah, I try to be in box zero. Have you been in but box even, zero for a long time or is it something that you like eventually got to after realizing it wasn't the best strategy to not be inbox zero. I'm speaking about myself. I definitely, as you know, actually was not an inbox zero person, but I have been for the last few weeks and it's so much easier to be productive. I have to say. Yes. I've always been inbox zero. And part of that is because so much of my work relies on email. That's where I'm getting assignments. That's where I'm, you know, communicating with people that I'm working with clients, editors, all of that. So it's really important for me to be on top of my email. And honestly, when I'm in a situation where I'm like maybe at a grocery store somewhere where I'm just waiting in line, I'll just sit there and delete the junk and kind of go through and use those moments like that, that sort of dead time where you're kind of stuck somewhere to go through and make sure I'm cleaning out the junk and things like that. And it's really important to unsubscribe from all the things and all the junk that you're getting or have a separate email account. Like my work account is not something that I have. I have very few things or subscriptions going to that unless it's work related. So I have separate email accounts for those things so I can focus on the important ones. And I even have sort of on my, because I get a lot of spam PR emails because of all the freelance, especially travel writing that I do. But I have it so that my main email is not the one on my website so that I can kind of help filter out those two and it's not getting in the way of my editors. And if it's someone important, I'll then respond from my other account or I'll tell them, hey, let's use this account as well. So that's some tactics that I use for that. But that helps me keep the, it basically helps filter the stuff so it's not all in one place. Yeah, that's, I found that that's really helped. Um, also, do you write emails in your notes in your iPhone? I have found that I do that sometimes because sometimes my internet connection drops or if I'll get out of the Gmail and then I'm like, oh, I lost the email or somehow. Um, I think that's helped me stay organized and productive as well. I will, it depends on where I am. If I'm somewhere, I might write them in the notes on my phone. If I'm just waiting, I'll usually proof it on a computer before I send it. And then, but I'll do a lot of things, honestly, just Microsoft Word. I'll just type them out, things like that, just to make sure everything looks good. But sometimes it's something I'm writing that I'm going to send later and I'll come back and like, especially if I'm pitching a story, then I'm definitely going to come back and read it and kind of edit it as I go. And so that type of pitch email would be something I'd save in Microsoft Word and come back to it later as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking of, cause I know as nomads, we're on the go all the time and it's like, how can you get things done? But you know, sometimes you can't have your laptop completely open or you don't want to have it mm -hmm. open in certain areas. Um, mm -hmm. Have you ever written an email on a plane when you didn't have Wi-Fi and then it, it will send as soon as you hit the Wi-Fi? I don't trust that normally, but I, I basically will write them out and have them written in either my notes or word as we just discussed. And then as soon as I get to a situation where it could, because sometimes there'll be a depending on what email client you're using, it'll come back with a, you know, saying, hey, this didn't work and it won't send it later. I mean, you can, it, it can have issues. So I just, I don't trust that. So I just would wait till I actually have Wi-Fi again to send it. I would just have the email ready to go. 
so that it's just there. Just Great. copy and paste and good to go. Mm -hmm. Things for all of us to think about um, for those of us listening that may not be in box zero or may not have thought about when they could write emails in different places. Hopefully this is sinking in. <laughs> and also wanted to ask you, Anna, do you have any best apps or websites or platforms that you use to help stay on track? Well, for me, it's really just simple things like reminders. I'm a Mac-based person, Apple-based. So the reminders on my phone that'll show up on my Mac through iCloud, that's huge for me because I'll set them for obvious things like meetings. If I need to follow up with an editor about a pitch, we're like talking about a story and they're like, oh, let's do that in October, November. I'll set a reminder a few weeks before to reach out to them to work out the details, something like that. But it's also helpful for things like airline credits. Like I recently got an airline credit because I had to change an Alaska Airlines flight. And it's like this $100 credit, but I literally left two weeks later to go abroad for six months to places where Alaska Airlines doesn't fly. So I set a reminder on my phone for March to be like, oh, hey, don't forget you have these Alaska Airlines credits because that's when I'll be back in the U.S. and might actually use the credit. So it's things like that that are really important. Anything like that, I will set like even months in advance just so I don't remember. Don't forget. And then also remembering to pack certain things before a big trip based on where I'm going and if it's work related or not or the climate there might be something important that I might forget and the craziness of packing and trying to get ready. So things like that, like I reminders are, I could not live without reminders. They are the best thing that I do. I have them all the time on my multiple times a day. They'll go off with things like that. Even if I think of something when I'm walking, if I'm like at lunch and I'm like, oh, I need to send that email. I forgot about it. I'll set a reminder then to do it in an hour when I get back or something, just so it's on top of mind. That way I'm just not forgetting things. And it can be helpful for things like birthdays or other things like that as well, too, like in your personal life. But I absolutely, I have reminders set for all my birthdays in my calendar on iCal, so it'll remind me the day of, so I don't forget birthdays and the day before. So just little things like that. And another thing when it comes more to Zoom calls, because I'm doing a lot of Zoom calls, a lot of workshops, things like that remotely, you know, in various parts of the world, we're talking crazy time zone differences here. So I always, when I schedule a Zoom call, I make sure it's in the other person's time zone. That way it doesn't confuse them. It also means that I didn't make a mistake with the conversion of the time zones. And this is really important because we just had daylight savings time and I was just in Europe and they had daylight savings and a week later the US had it. And by the time that happened, I was in Thailand. So then I was just so confused by everything. But having the fact that I've done things this way means all my Zoom calls, I know exactly when they are. And, and it, you know, it, auto, it, it updates for me in my calendar based on that. But you know, when you add your Zoom meetings to your calendar, like for me, I use iCloud, it automatically sets to my times on where I am. And then there's preset reminders for an hour before and 10 minutes before, things like that. And so that's really helpful for me to make sure I'm not messing anything up with the time zone issue and with being so, you know, with being remote and location independent. And then the iPhone has a really great feature. It's the clock app and there's a world clock section. And I've literally added the time zones to all the places where my editors are, where my friends are, family, you know, things like that. So when I know when I'm messaging people or reaching out, I know what time it is and I'm not messing anything up. And that way it just helps me verify that I'm not messing up the time zone. It's just good to be like, okay, because there's always this little panic before a Zoom call to say, did I mess up the time zone? But that lets you know that you didn't. And so things like that are really, really important. And the other thing that I really do is that I schedule emails in advance. Like that's something I, but I, I like to do that when I know I have good service because you don't want them to, you know, I'm always paranoid. I guess I've had issues with specific email clients in the past who sending things multiple times or just not sending at all. If there's an error, it just sits there in the outbox and you don't notice it till later. And you're like, well, I haven't they responded. And it's like, oh, because the email didn't send. That's why. So I'll make sure I have good, you know, Wi-Fi when I'm doing this. But I auto schedule, schedule emails. And I like to make sure that they show up during business hours for the person that I'm emailing. And my thought behind that is, is that it sort of puts it the top of their inbox and when they're at their desk and it helps keep it from getting lost. Now, I mean, is this foolproof? Not necessarily. People can check their email at different times, but I don't want someone to be checking their email at night you know, at midnight or something right before they go to bed or, or 10 p.m. and they see my email and they forget about it. So for me, that's something that's really important. And even if I have like a Zoom call coming up with someone that we've scheduled way in advance, I'll send a reminder email and that I can auto schedule even when I make the actual Zoom um, call and send out the link. So but just having those things there is really, really helpful for me. The one thing I won't do is like, for example, if I'm following up with the editor or something like that, I won't auto schedule an email for something like that because they might respond before that auto scheduled email goes out. And I'm going to look silly when we've already been talking about something. And then this auto scheduled email that I did weeks before goes falling up and they're going to be confused by it. So you have to pick and choose what you can schedule and what you can't schedule. But another thing that helps me product, like from a productivity standpoint is that I'm often sending the same types of emails 
So I'll save emails that I send to editors pitches and then I can use some of the, you know, the word choices, like they're just basically certain sentences, certain things, the diction that I use can apply to other situations. And that way I can kind of look at that and say, okay, well, this was worded really well. So I'm going to take this portion of this email and that's going to be part of my sort of like, essentially like a template. And that also helps me with those situations from a productivity standpoint. I'm like, this is already phrased well, this is well written. I'm going to take this part of this email and, you know, and then condense it and then personalize it for what I'm doing. All such great so ideas. So I'm, I'm wondering, you were saying like also that you do a lot of work far in advance and I'm wondering how you mentally are able to do that because I will admit I have trouble with procrastination sometimes and I'm like, oh, I have time later. Is there, are there any tips that you can give for like forcing yourself to tell yourself it's worth it to do it now, even if it's something that isn't going to happen for two more months, three more months, like with flights or things like that? Well, it depends on the type of thing in, in the situation, like what you're working on, what type of task. It's If it's something where if I can do it now and it's going to be just as easy or the same amount of effort for me to do it now versus later, it's not, there are certain things where you just, like I can't write a story until I do an interview. So there's no point in me trying to write certain things until I've done the interview. So that's silly. But if it's a situation where it's something that I can auto schedule or do it in advance, where I can just go ahead and do it now, for me, that just means that I don't have to think about it. And with some of my teaching, it's stuff like that, where I'm like, okay, I'm going to, I've got, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do some work. I'll have things prepared, but then I can auto schedule when emails go out about things that I know are set for that week. That's the activity we're going to do. This is a really cool extra resource that I just want to send out to share and it matches what we talked about that week. So there's situations like that where I would have that ready to go because there's nothing. I mean, if something changes, I can go back and edit it, but that way it's just scheduled, but it just depends on what it is. But again, if it's something where it's the same amount of effort now, it's not going to make it easier. If I wait to do it and it makes it easier for me, then obviously I'm going to wait to do it. But if I can do it now and it's the same waiting versus doing it now, I'm going to do it now just so that it's ready. And it makes, it's less stress for me because I feel ahead of the game. It allows me to work on other projects. And like a lot of times what I'll do for editors is I'll set an, I'll set a deadline because I usually control my own deadlines, but I'll set a deadline knowing that I'm going to turn it in early, but I do have that buffer if anything happens. And so that, that really is helpful for me being ahead of those things. And then if I get in a situation where I have a lot of other work projects come that I'm not expecting that are great projects that I can't say no to, that gives me that buffer to be like, okay, I can take on these projects and this other work that I've already committed to is not going to suffer because I'm so far in advance in that type of situation. So I think that that is, part of it as well. And then one thing, this is just a good example of things we've talked about, but for me, it's like, if I know something's coming up, I will plan for it. So for example, I, you know, I have location independent, I can pretty much for the most part be where I want to be. And like, for example, in March, I actually decided to go home and spend a month with my parents because my dad makes furniture for a living 18th century style. And I have never made a bed. I've made a lot of other furniture, but I wanted to make a bed. It's something that I wanted to do and spend the quality time with my dad. But obviously I still have to work while I'm visiting them. But the way that I did is I spent the morning doing my own work because that's when I'm the most productive based on the things we talked about, like the Daniel Pink book and everything. But in the afternoon, I was building the bed and doing the furniture. But I did because I couldn't work necessarily all day with that. I had to plan ahead to have that time free. I, I had less deadlines during that time or I worked in advance so that I knew I could have the time to do that. So that's where the planning comes in. We're saying, hey, this is something I want to do. I know this is coming up. Let me work ahead where I can so that I can take the time to do that. And so that was something that I'm really, you know, I did the bed and I think it was a wonderful thing, but I was able to do that because of the advanced planning and not be stressed out and be up late at night working in situations like that. Yeah, I'm sure there's many nomads that definitely feel that stress of wanting to do too much in a day and they need to get their work done, but maybe they can't enjoy something like you with the bed, you know, as much because they're still like, oh, the work didn't get done. So if they had planned well and in advance and even did more things in advance before doing that event, then yeah, you're going to be able to have that mind freedom. I like that mind freedom. It's, it's definitely true. You just mental freedom to, to not be stressed, definitely be more relaxed. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to take these tips and and do and think about the mind freedom for going forward. So I'm less stressed and less procrastinate of a procrastinator, let's say. Okay, I'm curious uh, about a different type of productivity, the physical side. So, do you have any physical productivity hacks, such as a special exercise that helps you stay focused? And I also know that you do not drink coffee, which I think some people may think is a productivity hack in itself in the morning. So, how do you live and do all these productive things without drinking coffee, Anna? <laughs> I uh, gave up caffeine in 2008. I'm very proud of that because I was addicted to it. I'm a very high energy person, so I do not need the caffeine to have the energy. 
But I will tell you to the point where I was drinking a two liter Coke a day and no one should drink a two liter bottle of Coca-Cola a day. Let me tell you that. And it was just wreaking havoc on my health. Like I kept having like multiple cavities every time I went to the dentist. And then I was having a lot of pain in my shoulders and my neck because my muscles were dehydrated from all the caffeine. And so I kind of had to give it up. But honestly, it was the best thing that I've ever done. And so I don't need that to be productive. So that's something that it's funny. I, I, you know, I have patience with my friends that need their coffee, but it's just something that I can't relate to. And I missed it at first, but it's just been so long now that it's just, I'm so used to not, I'm scared to drink it now. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's, it's just not something that I need for what I'm doing for me. It's just like, I usually pretty much, I can be awake. Exercise can help me too. But um, just as long as I get up, wash my face, have a shower, like eat breakfast, I'm fine. But the biggest thing for me would be from a physical standpoint, like physical productivity tips. There's not really an exercise, but I like to have a list. Usually the list is a running list. It'll sometimes be on paper, but usually just in the notes on my computer. And it's just like, I stick to that, like what's first, what's next. And then sometimes I'll even organize it by like, Hey, I need to do this tomorrow afternoon or this night or this day, like Tuesday, I need to do this. So it's batched when I have the, and I've allotted time in my day and in my brain to do that. But to be honest, when I'm writing, I just need silence. I need to be alone. I, I used to not be that way, but now that's sort of become when I'm the most productive. Um, so I can't do co-working spaces really anymore if I'm working on any kind of writing project. No music, just quiet. And then I honestly I have to put my phone in the other room. I'm really bad about like looking at Instagram and things like that. But what I'll do is I'll put it in the other room. It's on, My phone is always on silent all the time. I don't know how people live without their phone being on silent. But that way I'm not being distracted by that. And then, and I won't look at it till lunch, you know, for hours and then, or until I've hit the goal that I'm trying to work on for the project that I'm working on. And often if it's a crazy busy period, as I said, the freelance world is a monsoon. So I might have like 10 different stories that I'm working on or something. And I'll delete apps like Facebook and Instagram for days or weeks at a time. If I'm on a big deadline, that way I can't use, use them as a means to procrastinate. And Instagram is something that I have this love-hate relationship with because it is good for me from a work standpoint. It does help me promote my photography, especially I've gotten hired through Instagram for things. So I feel this like need to be on it, but then I also kind of hate it because of the time that it takes to, it's a big time commitment, especially to do stories and things well. And so for me, it's just finding that balance of like, okay, this, this other project is first and deleting these apps. I'll get back on those when these projects are done. So that's something that, that really helps me. I think you're pointing towards something that Cal Newport talks about in Deep Work, right? We didn't talk about mm -hmm. that book specifically, but isn't mm -hmm. that kind of what he's relating to is like, you need these times to get deep into your work. And how can you do that if you've got like your phone buzzing or like you're looking at all these pop-ups, you know, mm -hmm. I think people forget about the power of um, not being distracted. No, I agree. And I think it's so important. It's something for me because it takes me a while to refocus. I know they've done studies saying, I don't know, I've heard oh, it takes 20 minutes for you to refocus after an interruption. I don't know if that's true or not. But for me, it does take a while. And especially when I'm writing or in something, I don't want to stop until I've got it out there. And it, what's kind of funny is there is a, and for me, especially with writing, just getting my first draft done, and even if it's terrible, there's a book called Bird by Bird by Annie Lamont, which I highly recommend if you want to be a writer. And there's a title called Shitty First Drafts. And honestly, like just getting that really terrible first draft out there written, even though it's a lot of it might not even stay in the final having that out of my head and onto the paper is the biggest thing that helps me productivity wise and stress wise it's sort of like getting that out there even though it's terrible and I'm gonna just getting it out of my head in there is like once I get to that I feel like okay I can relax I can go to bed or I can go do what I need to do now and I can come back with this tomorrow or later with fresh eyes and do the work but just having it all out of my head and onto the paper is a huge thing from a productivity standpoint yeah just starting and then bird by bird yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it seems sounds so simple, but it's so powerful. Mm -hmm. Well, have you, I'm curious, have you tried any productivity tools that someone may have recommended to you and then you later quit using them because you actually found them to be overhyped? Trying to save other people some time here. <laughs> well, I mean, not really. I mean, I used Evernote for a bit, but I found the notes app to work on my iPhone and Mac just enough for me. It was perfect. You know, that's all I really need. So not necessarily, it's just, Figuring out the simple things, again, I think that people just need to figure out how to use these simple tools in a way that are effective for them and personalize it and figure out what they need. And once you figure that out, I think it's just going to make your life easier. But for me, those are the the main things. I mean, most of the tools I recommend are very simple. Actually, I'm the same with Evernote. I just used it for a day or two. And then I keep going back to the notes, I think, because it's just simpler. Whatever is simple. Mm -hmm. So you have to, we already have enough decision fatigue probably in our day. So yeah, find those maybe three simple tools. I, I really like reminders that you mentioned. I have continued to use it since you introduced it to me and it, I think it is changing my life. So 
Shout out to you, Anna. <laughs> so guys, glad to hear have, that. I don't know if like non iPhones, what, what they have or what the name of their similar app is called, but if you use reminders on the iPhone and start setting all these reminders for yourself for everything, it's really powerful. And you can even like Siri will, you can tell Siri to set a reminder for you. If you're driving the car, you can be like, Hey Siri, do this and set this. And that's great. You just have to make sure you enunciate. And sometimes she doesn't understand what you said. So you have to look at the word later and be like in phonics, trying to figure out what you'd said. <laughs> yeah. Make sure, make sure that Siri knows what you're talking about. So this might be a U.S. only question, but do you have any tips for staying on top of your taxes and getting them done in the most productive way as a freelancer? Taxes can be the most complicated thing about being a freelancer, but for me, staying organized and using spreadsheets. So I've got this Excel spreadsheet where there is a drop down menu for every category for the expenses for my freelance work. And these are the same categories that are on part two of the Schedule C form, which is what all freelancers have to file if you're you know, making income and you're getting to 99 forms, tax forms. Now, the categories range from things like advertising to travel. And then I have the spreadsheet set up so that basically it just automatically tallies those categories for me so that at the end of the year, I just give that to my um, accountant and that's what I use for my taxes. So ideally, I try to update this ideally every two weeks would be great, but at least once a month I sit down and I make sure everything's in there where it should be. And I also have a, a spreadsheet for my income that I'm making, you know, that type of thing. So I've got to tally where I made what with certain things because not all companies send you the 1099 form. So I have to have that income there. So I do keep that in there as well. And then I do think it's important to schedule a time every month to do this and it's going to make your life easier in the end. I know it's nothing, people don't enjoy doing this. No one does. I definitely don't. But the more you stay on top of it, the easier it's going to make your life. And there are apps like Genius Scan that'll make PDFs. Like you can scan receipts and make PDFs from it. You can just airdrop them from your phone to your computer. That's really big for me because I'm traveling. And if I have some work expenses when I'm traveling, I'm not going to carry around these like paper receipts, you know, for six months at a time or go look for a place. To, that's why just using the phone is great and having it as a PDF automatically is great. And then there's an app called Dollarbird that I like. And it's basically for adding in expenses. I use it to track. It's just sort of a personal thing where I just for fun when I'm traveling, I kind of track how much I'm spending just because I'm really into the mechanics of that. I'm very, very much analytical. So I think that's the mindset that I have in my personality as well. But Dollar Bird could be really good for using for expenses. But for me, it lets me know what I'm spending when I'm traveling. And it helps me kind of balance out also from a budget wise standpoint too. But all of those, I think are really good apps. It can be helpful. But honestly, if you can just make a spreadsheet with those categories in it, it would be that will make your life a lot easier. Yeah, like you said, I know it can be painful, especially for some of us procrastinators out there. Like you might wait to the end of the year, but of course it's going to take you a lot longer. Um, this is the secret, guys. You lose a lot of time if you're not organized. You're a lot less productive. So all of these things I know will help us. So you said Genius Scan for the receipts and then Dollar Bird. Is, is Dollar Bird free? No, Genius Scan is free. Dollar Bird, you have to pay. You used to have a free option. Now you have to pay a monthly fee. I only pay for it when I'm using it when I'm traveling, but it's it's worth it for me. But it still saves your old information from, from before. <laughs> Even if you stop paying for it, like it's still there later. But yeah, it's still there later when you go to, to when you pay again. But Genius Scan is free and they do have like paid up every app. I mean, everybody's got a paid upgrade plan, but Genius Scan is free and then you can airdrop to your computer, which is what I do. Right. Well, a couple final questions for apps for you, because I just thought of this. Do you use TripIt? Have you ever used TripIt? I used to, and then I stopped. I can't remember why, but for okay. me, it's just, I, you know, I just have everything kind of added to my calendar and it just reminds me of things. And I usually know where I'm going and a lot of travel is work related for me now. So I have to go through, um, oh, there's a couple like apps I have to use for work specifically that it has everything in there. So TripIt doesn't really help me as much because I've got to use those apps. I have found it to be helpful when I'm just randomly doing a bunch of flight booking mm -hmm. and then it will scan mm -hmm. your emails and it just is, there is the free version where you can just see like confirmation numbers and times of the flights mm -hmm. and everything. And it, it will update sometimes a bit delayed if there is a delay in the flight, <laughs> but yeah. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I want to ask you is about LastPass or a kind of password app. Do you have any apps that like keep all your passwords in one place? I want to, I, yes, I do. One thing I will say about the TripIt is that what I do in my email is I'll have a folder and it'll just be like fall travel and I'll just put everything in there so I can go in that folder and find it in my email for travels or like if like an Italy trip, like I was in Italy for all of October and I have all the Italy stuff in there. So that's how I kind of manage that now. And then with, so the password app, I use one password. You do pay for it. I don't remember how much it is because I've had it forever, but it was a one-time fee and that has been fantastic for me to have everything in there. 
have the app on my phone. I have it on my computer. They talk to each other. It is fantastic. And so that's something that just makes my life so much easier as well. So I don't have to think about those and figure those out. They're just there. I don't put everything in there. It's mostly the important stuff, but that's just, if I'm shopping on a website where I'm buying clothes, I'm not going to put that password in the app, but for important things I do. Agreed. And I even know people that save all of their credit card details in there because if they lose the mm -hmm. credit card while traveling, they can still do online shopping uh, while they wait for something else. I do that. That is, the, that is saved me before big time. So that's something I do for everything. I have everything in there. Every number you could have, like I've got my, I even have my passport and driver's license number. Cause like, if I need those, I don't have to go dig for it. You know, if I've forgotten it, like I just got a new passport and it's got a new number. So it's like the one I've memorized for 10 years, you know, <laughs> it's different. So it's, it's things like that. They definitely are helpful in there too. Guys, this is life-changing stuff. Absolutely life-changing. Okay. Anna, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, are there any other things you want to add? No, I think we've covered a good amount. All right. So if people want to follow you, where can they go? Well, I have a travel blog that is Travel Like Anna. Um, and what I do is I talk about budget travel. I usually tell about, I break down what I spend on a trip to help people understand the finances of the cost of travel in places. And I'll have location guides from Travel Like Anna on Twitter. My photography website is Anna Mazurik Photo. So just my name and photo. And I'm the same on Instagram. Fantastic. Well, I'm sure from all of this, these like tracking tips and budgeting things, I, I'm sure that people are going to be interested in checking out how much these different places cost. And I know you do a really good job of being very organized and detailed with the expenses on that blog. So check it out, guys. Travel like Anna dot com. Yes. Thank you, Anna, so much for joining us. And I hope you have a great day. Uh, thank you for having me. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.